Hey Jude, don't make it bad. What do you want to do tonight? I don't know, bro. I'm so bored. Me too. I was gonna go bowling with my mom, though. Yeah? My grandmother hit me up. She was like, you wanna make frozen yogurt? I told her, yeah, so I think I gotta do that. Dude, that's lame. You can bring your mom, too. Let's let's both go bowling. No, dude, my grandmother hella doesn't like no, 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 no. You wanna go bowling with both of our moms. I wanna go bowling with both of our moms. Yeah. Let's go. Wait a minute. Abe, why am I doing this? I used a Jedi mind trick on you. I took AP Psychology, remember? Oh, of course. We have to review for that, don't we? Yeah, yeah. We're going to make this review video, so maybe you can learn them too. All right. Let's get to it. All right, Abe. Start us off. Gladly. Let's start with Unit 1, Psychology's History and Its Approaches. So given that you're taking an AP Psychology course, you should definitely know the definition of psychology. It's the science of behavior and mental processes. Behavior is anything done by a living organism. Mental processes are internal experiences that we cannot observe, but which we can infer from behavior. And don't forget that psychology is a science. It's more a way of asking and answering questions than it is a fixed, fixed set of findings. The biggest question in psychology is the nature versus nurture issue. Do human traits develop from biology or genetics? Or do they develop from experiences we have throughout our lives? Or both? Frank, what's the answer? Both. Yes, both. The answer is both. Nurture works on what nature endows. Nature and nurture both influence us. Definitely know Darwin's idea of natural selection. The principle that those organisms which happen to have traits that better equip them to reproduce and survive will pass on these superior genes to succeeding generations. Natural selection, for example, is why giraffes have evolved to be so tall. Frank, take it to Unit 2. Well, Unit 2 covers the research methods that scientists use in their experiments. Even in psychology, a field of science with little math, we can't just rely on gut instincts due to issues like hindsight bias and judgmental overconfidence. Instead, we need to use standardized research methods to make experimentation effective. Scientists use tools like controls and double-blind random assignment to try to eliminate issues like the placebo effect and other forms of bias. For example, if you're testing if a drug works, you'll give half the patients the real drug and half a placebo sugar pill. Those who get the sugar pill think they are also getting the treatment, even though they're not. They're called the control. Those who actually get the treatment are the experimental population. Scientists are careful to interpret the results they get using statistical methods like regression to look for correlation between cause and effect. Make sure that you're familiar with these basic statistical concepts like mean, median, standard deviation, and statistical significance. Also take a few minutes to make sure you're familiar with how researchers run modern experiments and assign controls and treatment. All right, Abe, walk us through unit three. Gladly. So a key principle, everything psychological is simultaneously biological. For example, if we have an urge for sex and human urges are something we study in psychology, we can also examine how chemicals in our body biologically produce that sexual urge. Biology and psychology are infinitely intertwined. So in this section, we dive into some biology. Neurons are nerve cells. They are the foundational building blocks of our nervous system. Sensory neurons carry messages from our body's organs and tissue to the brain and spinal cord, while motor neurons kind of do the opposite. They carry instructions from the brain and spinal cord to the body's tissues. When one neuron wants to pass on a message to another neuron, it fires an electrical pulse called an action potential that travels down the axon and triggers the, re triggers the release of neurotransmitters, which are these tiny chemical messengers. The neurotransmitters cross the synapse or the tiny gap between the axon tip of the sending neuron and the dendrite of the receiving neuron. Let's talk about the breakdown of the nervous system. 
So at the top, we have the division between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And the peripheral nervous system is broken down into the autonomic system and the somatic system. The somatic system controls our skeletal muscles. So it's important when Frank tries to bench 300 pounds to impress his grandma. 350, easy. Sure. The autonomic system controls muscles of our internal organs, so it's important for our heartbeat and our digestion. The autonomic system further divides into the sympathetic and parathetic, uh, parasympathetic systems. So the sympathetic system is responsible for expending energy. If you see a hungry bear and get scared, the sympathetic nervous system will accelerate your heartbeat and raise your blood pressure. The parasympathetic nervous system does the opposite. It conserves energy and calms you down by decreasing your heart rate, heart, heartbeat or lowering your blood sugar. Finally, remember the endocrine system, which secretes hormones or chemical messengers. And these chemical messengers act on the brain and influence our interest in food, sex, and aggression. The next part of Unit 3 looks at the varying structures of the brain. I definitely remember a couple questions from this part on the AP test when I took it, so I'd pay attention. Let's take a look at some of the oldest parts of the brain, the parts we share most with other animals. These are the brainstem and the thalamus. First, let's take a look at the older parts, uh, the brainstem. The most important is the medulla, which regulates functions like breathing and heartbeat. This is why if you're shot directly through the head, you die instantly. Your medulla turns off and you instantly lose your heartbeat and stop breathing. On top of the brainstem sits the thalamus, which acts as a switchboard for incoming signals from our nerves and then directs out signals as well. The cerebellum surrounds the bottom of the brainstem and coordinates our movements and emotions. Between the older parts of the brain and the newer parts, we have the limbic system, chief of which is the hippocampus, which processes memory. I remember that by thinking that if I saw a hippo on my college campus, it'd be really memorable. So that's how I remember it. Other parts of the limbic system include the amygdala, which regulates emotions, and the hypothalamus, which regulates basic motives like desire for food and sex. The new part of the brain is primarily the cerebral cortex, which runs our complex motor functions, basically all of our movement. The cerebral cortex also includes the two most important areas for language. These are first Broca's area, which is needed for formulating and expressing language, and second, Wernick's area, which processes incoming language, basically turns those sounds into your understanding of what that word is. So when someone says a sentence to you and you understand what that sentence means, that's your Wernick's area hard at work. It's important to know how our brains, uh, or that rather, our brains have a, pe a limited period in which they can grow and repair themselves. This period is known as plasticity. Basically, the brain becomes more rigid and fixed as we develop further. Now we're going to talk about how genes and our environment each define us. Basically, nature versus nurture. So let's dive into some gene biology. Every cell nucleus in your body has 46 chromosomes, which are made up of DNA molecules, which in turn contain our genes. We humans are all remarkably similar. Our gene sequences are 99.9% .9 identical, and they are 96% identical to chimpanzees. Okay, back to nature versus nurture. We know that nature has a strong influence on us because separated twins who are very, very genetically similar tend to have similar personalities even though they grew up in different households. So we're gonna give nature one point in this debate. On to nurture. Studies show that most kids adopted into caring and responsible households grow up to score higher than their biolog biological parents on intelligence tests. And they also end up healthier and more stable than their biological parents. So we gotta give nurture a point too. At the end of the day, nature and nurture, our genes and our environment work together to shape us. This also means that genes are self-regulating. They respond to different environments. For example, a butterfly that camouflages green in the summer 
turns brown in the fall because of a temperature-controlled genetic switch. More formally, we say that genes and experience interact, such that the effect that our environment has on us depends on our genes and vice versa. The effect that our genes have on us depends on our environment. Even if it gets colder in the fall, the butterfly wouldn't change colors without its genetic switch. And if the butterfly had temperature control, had a temperature controlled genetic switch, it wouldn't change colors if the weather stayed warm. So if I'm, if I'm going to leave you with just one thing, it's that we humans are products of both nature and nurture. All right, Frank, I'm handing you the reins to unit four. All right. Sensation and perception. Well, much of our interaction with the world is driven by our sensation and perception of what's going on in it. The first thing to note is that our attention, what we consciously focus on, is quite limited. Our brain blinds out much of what we're consciously perceiving. Think about it, Abe. You're often wearing socks, but you're rarely conscious of how they feel against your feet. I'm feeling them right now, and they're super comfy. Well, in some circumstances, we will be prone to notice stimuli that pops out. That's called the pop-out effect. But in other scenarios, if we're focusing on one specific thing, we'll actually blind out everything else, and that's known as change blindness. One of the most impressive aspects of our perception abilities is the human eye, an organ that detects the varying wavelengths of light and feeds that to the visual cortex in the back of the brain. We learned about that last unit. Anyway, that light passes through the pupil, basically the eye's lens, um, and this lens can be adjusted with the iris to take in varying amounts of light. This is why your pupils dilate and why your eyes get better and worse in dark or higher light. Our brain can do incredible things with the information it receives, including parallel processing. We can perceive many things at once. When we watch Abe run, we can register his speed, emotion from his expression, and the color of his clothes all at once. Other senses, such as hearing, are relatively less complex. The ear contains something called a cochlea which vibrates in response to air pressure changes, aka incoming noise. Auditory nerves in the cochlea translate the pressure changes into sound, which is then relayed to your brain. The loudness of the sounds is proportional to the auditory nerves stimulated. Our sense of touch is powered by nerve endings within our skin. These nerves detect varying degrees of pressure, warmth, cold, and pain. Pain is a great example of how our senses are a mix of physical and psychological. We know that pain is physical. Damage to the tissues causes nerve cells to relay pain to the brain. Ouch! <laughs> but we also know that pain is psychological. Experience and expectations both influence how painful something is. Taste is straightforward. Taste buds activate based on certain tastes, such as umami, sour, and sweet and communicate that to the brain. Smell, just like taste, is a chemical sense. Olfactory receptors under our eyes communicate smells, which are chemicals in the air, back to the brain. The final part of this chapter looks at how our brain organizes the inputs it gets from all the senses. Our brain uses a lot of tricks and shortcuts to pull meaningful information from all the sensory information being thrown at it. For example, to interpret eyesight, our brain uses the disparity between the images perceived by our two eyes to judge for relative distance, size, and speed of things that it's looking at. Other outside factors such as context and your emotions can also influence your perception and make it worse than you might think it is. Woo! Damn, man. Who would have thought bowling with our moms would be so much fun? Dude. Me. And best of all, it's only 8 p.m. Nice. Leaving us plenty of time to tackle units five through seven. I'm hyped, bro. Let's get going. Thank you guys for watching. Please like and subscribe, and we'll catch you guys in the next video. Hey, um, how's it going? Can see your body moving. Don't leave the party dying.